There's a dance that's in your chair You've given us the bed Now we're stirring up the head Bring the rain Yeah, just bless you, bless you, Engine House. I, um, Julie, um, I, uh, Julie's my wife. We've been with you for about six months and, um, we, uh, we've just been blessed, if uh, what Tiva said was great, but I think I, I've, I've got a, such a blessing. I'm so thankful for the opportunity this morning, because I just want to return the blessing. You've been such a blessing to me personally, to us to, as a couple, to Julie, just uh, in a place with the Lord that just need to be and growing in Him. And it's because of the, the atmosphere, because of the commitment and the drive of the heart of you, the people here at Engine House. And uh, I got caught up in that, and the Lord has blessed me so much. Come on. And strengthened me. So thank you. Thank you. Keep going. Keep pressing in. No, I know at times it's not easy, but it's worth it. So let's keep pressing in together as a body, encouraging one another and seeing everything that Jesus wants to do in us and through us. Amen. 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 Yeah, good. My wife, Julie's not with us this morning. Uh, she, uh, she's gone on a week's holiday with her friend, a lady friend. <laughs> And she said, I want, I'm going on holiday for a week with, Ma with, with Mel. And I was expecting to say, um, would you like to come too, darling? <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't fall. So uh, I had to iron my own shirt this morning. <laughs> you can tell how long it was since I... <laughs> I tell you how long it was I, I, I used an iron. Last, I was looking for the, uh, the place where you put the hot coals in the iron. But apparently you can plug them in these days. <laughs> It's a while since I've ironed, but there you go. But it's just good to be with you, and uh, yeah. I'm just excited by what God, God's got for us, excited by what God's going to do, and I, I hope you're ready for a shaking, not from me and not maybe necessary today, but, but in the course of the life of the church, as we've already shared this morning. Um, I, I grew up, as Steve said, I've been a pastor, I was a pastor for 23 years, paid pastor in the church. I've, been, I've grown up in a church that believed the Word of God and a pastor who was baptised in the Holy Spirit right from being a baby. And uh, so that's a great, great privilege. Uh, but just sensing there's more, and sensing that the heart of the church here that we're pressing in for all that God has got. And uh, I want to be a part of that, I want to encourage in that, and I want to play my part in ministering in that uh, and, and just loving with people. But, um, but, but just trusting that the Lord will take us there. And I just want to, are you open for God to, to rock your world? Yeah. Yeah. Are you open for God to Come shake on. your world? I have a sneaky suspicion that, that even though we're good, we're Bible believers and we know the Holy Spirit, that still we're almost bolting that understanding of God onto a model of church that maybe isn't just quite fine-tuned according to what he wants it to be. Yeah, that's right. And he wants to do something that will just release the church as it was always intended to be. And sometimes we say, well, it's good. We're enjoying the Lord's presence. We're enjoying the anointing of the Spirit. Isn't this it? And uh, sometimes we've got to say, well, we can't confuse the gracious blessing of God with us having got things exactly right all the time. He blesses us not because we get it right, but because he loves us. And because he's a blesser. And so we've got to keep asking, Father, how do you want us to do this thing? Not to panic, not to fret, because as we're looking for it, I completely believe that a humble people who are looking for the will of God won't miss it. Yeah. He's too good of a father to let you miss it if you're looking for it. Yeah. And so keep looking for it because we'll find it. In the meantime, we'll enjoy one another, we'll enjoy God, and we'll grow and go in Him. Amen. And that's the sort of theme that I'm on this morning. It's about sort of uh, looking for that... Uh, the, the, the allowing God to deal with us, to, to deal radically with us, and to shake us, and to, to move us and position us for the power of God that he wants to pour out into us and through us. Um, I do believe that God wants to send revival. Amen. Amen. Revival. If you're new to church, you may think, well, what is that word, revival? Uh, revival is a word that if you've been in church any length of time, you'll have heard. And uh, it, it is what it says. Something's not quite as alive as it should be. And so it gets brought back to the place of life that it really should be. It's revived. And uh, throughout church history, if you read, you see there are times when God's moved in a special way. And the church has come alive again uh, in, in a new and a powerful way. When the church has got itself into position with what God wants it to do. I believe that God wants to send revival yeah. to us. Not just to us, but to all his body. I believe that he will if a people who are hungry enough and seeking him enough. And what we've got is good. 
But it's nothing compared with what there will be when God moves in his grace and in his power as he wants to do among us. There's a song that, that, that you may know, one of the lines is, uh, Father of creation, the world has yet to see the full release of your promise, the church in victory. And we're looking, we want to see again the full release of his promise. He's already poured out his spirit at Pentecost and all of Pentecost is available for us today. We just need to believe it and press into it. But I do believe he wants to, he can't do it as, he, as we are now. He needs to shape and change our lives. Yeah. He needs to shape and change our lives. And um, um, I just want to dwell on, uh, for a little while on that and just pray, pray the Lord uses this time to, to do that. We're going to turn to 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. And uh, it's the story of Elisha. Elisha was a prophet. Uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel, the kingdom split. It was a whole, and then it became a north and a south, Judah and Israel, the north. And uh, when the north split off, immediately started going astray. And uh, God sent miracle-working prophets into the northern kingdom to say, hey, those gods you're worshipping, they're useless, they're powerless. But look at me, I'm the God who produces, who works in power. And he tried to get their attention through power-working prophets. And Elisha was one of those. And this is an episode in the life of Elisha. It's 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 1. It's a story, well, well, let's read the story and then we'll go through it. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophet cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in your house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbours, empty vessels, and not too few. Then go in, shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there isn't another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God and he said, go, sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Isn't that an awesome story? This woman, she's in trouble, her husband has died, there's no welfare state. And she's no way a means of support. In those days, if you had debts, your children, you could be sold into slavery. Uh, different from the nations around. In Israel, that would be for a limited period, for a maximum of a seven-year period. But that's how you would pay your debts. You would work off your debt. She didn't want to lose her children. So she had this difficult problem. And we've thought about that this morning. People who are going through struggles and wrestles. This woman had a wrestle. She had a problem. She had a difficulty. Her, her precious kids. Her husband had already died. And she was going to now lose her kids. And uh, more than that, she said, when the prophet said, what have you got in the house? She says, I have nothing except a jar of oil. And you're thinking, okay, that's got really, really bad. You know, she hadn't even got a tin of beans. Not even a tin of Aldi beans. Which, you know, she didn't have anything. She had obviously tried to pay off the debtors and failed. She tried to feed her kids and now she was down to the last jar of oil. She was in a desperate situation, yes? She went to where it mattered. Are you in a desperate situation? She went to the prophet. She went to the one who was in touch with God. Yeah. And that's what we need to do this morning. We need, if we've got issues, we need to go. And we've done that today. We need to go to the one who can answer. The one who can answer. And she did get an answer. And he gave her an answer. And one of the things I want us to note this morning is that the answer that she got, part of that answer was already in her house. Yeah. Part of that answer was already in her possession. Something needs to happen to it, though, before it became the full answer. And one of the things I want to say to us, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, I want to say to you, the answer for all your problems is already in your heart. He is the Holy Spirit of the living God. Yeah. Yeah. And he, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We may need to do something to cultivate and culture his life and his work within us. But you've already got the answer to your problem right in your heart. The living God lives inside of you. 
And so she went in and the word was, go and get vessels, not a few. Go to your neighbours, go to your friends and get as many empty jars as you can. And you can imagine the kids running around in a bit of a game and there's hope here. There's life beginning to flow. And then he said, when you've got them, go in, shut the door and begin to pour. And begin to pour. And as she did, the Lord poured out and she sold it. Wow, what an answer. And I believe the Lord wants to give us the hope of an answer today. And uh, I wonder if you can see yourself in the woman's situation, but I also wonder if you can see yourself in the woman's answer to her problem. Knowing that your God is sufficient. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory. I really believe God wants to put us on a footing uh, to prepare us for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I really believe, and that's my heart this morning, to say to you, God wants to move in power yeah. among us more than he yeah. is doing. Yeah. But at the moment, the stuff that needs to happen before he can do that in us, we need to position ourselves so that we're ready to receive an outpouring of his presence. This woman, she had the Holy Spirit. She had the, she had the oil. And the oil is an illustration of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what it is in this story, but certainly in Scripture it is. She had the oil, but she didn't have enough of it. Something needed to happen. She needed to gather the vessels. She needed to prepare. And then God would come. I read a book uh, way back when, 1986. It was a popular book by the, the guy who had the biggest church in the world at the time. A man called Yongi Cho. Anybody heard of Yongi Cho? And his book was Prayer Key to Revival. One of the things that he said in that book, revival is this thing I'm thinking about, was that one of the reasons he said that God doesn't send revival sometimes is because it, it, it's, it's such a flush of his presence. He says that we can't contain it. And it would just fritter away and we'd lose it. And revival isn't some sort of force. You know, uh, I was thinking before, I like, I like movies, I like films. And uh, as we've already had today, so film tickets given out, that's great. Um, but I remember it was on telly at Christmas time, Force 10 from Navarone. It was a, a love of good Alistair McLean novel. And uh, you know, there's this dam, and they blow this dam up. And when the dam goes, the water floods, and there's no control, it goes everywhere. That's not revival. God doesn't just send a force, and it goes everywhere. Revival is God's own very presence Himself. It's his own very person. It's not just some force we receive in revival. It's more of him himself. And so you can understand why as he pours out himself, he doesn't want us to be in a position where that gets frittered, where that gets lost. We don't want to be in a position where we, we treat the preciousness of his presence in an unworthy manner. Wow. He wants to prepare us so that when he comes, we know the value of what yeah, is bringing. And we treasure it. And we, we hold on to it. I was just uh, listening to, again, uh, last night to uh, the film that Heidi Baker is in, the, uh, the Compelled by Love film. Anybody seen that film, The Life Story of Heidi Baker? It's awesome. She's an awesome woman of God there in Mozambique. And one of the things that was said about Heidi Baker is that she treasures the presence of God. She honours the presence of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, God trusts her with miracles. She wow. honours the presence of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, God can trust her with a mighty outpouring of his anointing. Revival is God himself. His own very person. And we've got to be prepared. It's like this, this thing in the story about the woman bringing the many jars. I believe the Lord wants us to start bringing jars. He wants us to start bringing things. To, you know, when she first brought the jars into her house, I thought I'd get my clock out and see what time it was. We don't work by clock time. <laughs> that, that was really, really dangerous. <laughs> I'll work by that clock. It stopped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. You know, when the kids first started bringing the jars into the house, they were still empty. It was a preparation. Yeah. There's a preparation. <coughs> Another film. Anybody seen The Flight of the Phoenix? You know that film? About the plane that crash landed in the desert. And uh, they had to wreck the plane. And out of the plane, they built another smaller plane, and they escaped out of the desert. Have you ever seen that film? Yeah. Dennis Quaid's in the new one. Uh, Richard Attenborough and James Stewart in the old one. The old one's better. Uh, 
Uh, but imagine, I just I saw this illustration came of, of crash landing in a desert in this play. Of, and that almost is the church. The church is this, this center of life, but it's in the midst of, 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 of desert. It's in the midst of what Satan's got control of in a desert place. You know, they went through all sorts of struggles in that desert. One of them was thirst. One of them was thirst. And they struggled for water and to find water. But imagine that this, uh, this plain was full of buckets. You know what buckets are? I don't have to say buckets in Cornish. Bucket. Okay. It's full of buckets. You know, what happens if, you, if, you, if one night it rained and rained and rained and rained and rained and all the buckets that were in the plain were still in the plain? How would you feel in the morning when you woke up? you feel a proper Charlie <laughs> and you'd still be very thirsty. When do you put the buckets out? Before the rains come, yeah. in expectation, yeah. in anticipation, yeah. for the Christian in prophetic declaration mm. that God is going to come in the power of his presence. Mm. And that's what the challenge of this passage is. What are the buckets, what are the vessels that you're going to start enlarging, that you're going to start making bigger, so that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he can pour into your heart and your life. And there's a phrase in this scripture, and it says, not a few. The prophet says to her, don't just gather a few. Yeah. You see, the temptation is to say, oh, I turned up at church today. Hey, that's good. And it is. It's awesome. I love it. But there's this, there's this emphasis on gathering as much as you possibly can. There's this emphasis on, hey, it's not just about turning up at meetings. It's about preparing and shaping the whole of my life. Yeah, come on. Not a few. Not a few. There's got to be an intensity. Yes. There's got to be an intentionality. Yes. There's got to be a focus. Yes. You know, the kids didn't go off and play at this time. This was a life and death circumstance. The kids didn't go down the street. They were helping the mum gather the buckets in, gather the vessels in. There's got to be a focus. Yeah. Because the focus says to God, we're serious. Mm. We're serious about your blessing. Mm. We want to be spoiled for everything else. But we want to be serious about pursuing you. We don't just want to gather a few. And I want to promise you, to make you a promise. In the end of this story, you know, she came to the end of the vessels and she said, pass me another. And the lad said, there's no more. And the oil stopped flowing. But I'll make you a promise that if you'll yield to God and follow in the days of your life, the oil will never stop flowing. It will never stop flowing. Because Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. And let him drink who believes in me. And out of his innermost being shall flow streams of living water. Jesus. If we'll get this right, those streams will never stop flowing. Hallelujah. That's the sort of people Hallelujah. that he wants. Yeah. Is that what you think? Is that what you thought church was about? Yeah. Me neither. But we've got to get it to the place where it is. Yeah. Because the world needs to see Jesus in all his glory. Yeah. And at the moment, the, church, the world mocks the church. It thinks it's a powerless institution. It thinks it's something it can ignore. But the church is the body of Christ. They're ignoring Jesus. Jesus. They're ignoring the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They're ignoring my Savior. They're ignoring the very one who made them. The one who gives them life and sustains them. The one who is the goal of all things. We've got to put him on display. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to let the world see him as he really is. And that's going to mean a change. If we keep doing what we've always done, we will just get what we've always had. Yeah. If we keep doing what we've always done, we've got to change. Yeah. There's got to, well, for me, the hats. Yeah. Uh, as I told you, Julie was away this week. And uh, I sort of took the opportunity to think, okay. Um, I've been thinking that I watch too much telly, and I do. <laughs> okay, confession. Because in the end of the day, it's too easy to cuddle up on the sofa, Log burner on, just hang out and chill. That's just, but you know, it just can get too much, you know? There's going to be sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And all the time, I thought, Julie's away. Right, okay, look, I'll have a TV fast this week. <laughs> uh, so I went on a TV fast. And uh, yeah, sometimes that was a little bit hard. Tuesday night, I came in from work, and after I committed that, and, and I thought, oh, I just fancy chilling. You know, just while I was eating my tea, I thought, oh, it's not, I'm going to put my telly on. No, I'm putting the telly on. Just, just while I'm a tea, I'm going to take some time with the Lord after. And no, I'll just put it on while I'm a tea and, uh, and I'll be on to watch something. And I finish my tea, got me coffee, had me a piece of cake, because that's my routine. <laughs> and and, uh, and watched a bit more telly. And at 8 o'clock, I thought, all right, now I'll stop. I'll stop. Lord, I've been disciplined. I've stopped. 
And I went up to my room and began to read and pray a little bit. And I began just to worship to finish off, and you know, nothing came. His presence didn't come. And I thought, strange, I've been really blessed. I've liked his presence. has been going really, really easy. Nothing came. And I began to think, I thought, you watched telly. And you said you wouldn't. Not it, surely. It's not bothered by now. Half a TV. That can't be it, surely. So one way to find out, confess it, repent of it. And if the Holy Spirit comes and blesses you, you know that he's bothered about an hour and a half's TV. Wow. And so I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I confessed that. I said I wouldn't, and I did. And I'm sorry. Within 10 seconds, his sweetness fell. Wow. And he blessed me with his presence. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't know you cared. I didn't even know you noticed me that much. Look, it's just little me. I didn't know you noticed me. I didn't know you cared about an hour and a half telly that I was watching, Father. I didn't know you cared about what I did with my time and what I said I would give to you and you would call me to account for what I said I would give to you. It's not just me. It's you too. He cares. He cares about how we spend our time. Yeah. And one of the things I really think that he wants to shake up in us is time. The dedication and the devotion of our time. I really think he wants to overhaul that. I just want to go, just listen to it for a bit. Buckets, buckets, these buckets that they gathered, what could they be for us? I've mentioned one, time. What could these things be that we need to, as it were, increase capacity, prepare, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Are you, ready? Are you okay to do a bit of work? Yeah. If you were to turn into twos and threes just for two minutes, could you just chat amongst yourself and think, what are the sort of things God could be calling us to, to be a preparation for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, if you were engaged with that for yourself, uh, if, you, if you're new, or if you're really uncomfortable with this, don't feel embarrassed, don't feel pushed into it, just sit there and think about it for yourself. But if you, if you would like to, break into twos, threes, not much more than that, you don't have much time to talk, and say, okay, this woman gathered the empty vessels. God's calling us to prepare. What is, I said time is one as an example. We do the things that you can think of that we've got to expand and get ready. Buckets that we can get out of the plane and put in the desert, ready for the outpouring to be filled. What are the things he's asking us to do? How do we prepare? Do you want to do that right now, just for a couple of minutes, and just to engage with the word? Just a minute, so if you sort of hop into the talking, you want to pass over and let somebody else have a go? back to a, a close, that'd be great. <laughs> Lovely. Not looking for big long answers, but if someone would be brave enough to, to, just to shout, maybe even one word answers, just shout out, what were you talking about? What do you think? What vessels need to get bigger? What needs to be prepared? Anybody shout something out? We need a word. Word of God. Is that a good one? Yeah. Getting into the word. Excellent. Anything else? Availability. Coming back to that time thing, isn't it? Structure. Yeah, anything else? Boldness. Boldness, yeah. Reach to go moving out. As we get bold and move out, then God can use us. Empathy. Empathy, loving people. Love. Genuine Holy Spirit love, yeah. 
Final sins? Yeah. Everything belongs to him. It's all his. Yeah, stewardship of our finances. Honoring God with our wealth. Fellowship. Fellowship. Uh, being together, a big one. But real fellowship, though. Not just meetings. Yeah. Real heart-to-heart -heart communion in the spirit. Yeah. yeah. Patience, absolutely. How we eat and drink. What do you mean? How we eat and drink. How we eat and drink. Yeah, yeah the amounts we eat. Yeah. Oh, I was listening to Leonard Ravenhill, and he really challenged me. He said, I just eat enough to live. I thought, oh! <laughs> 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 Leonard Ravenhill is a, 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 pre, a prophetic preacher. He's gone to be the Lord now. But I heard him say that I was challenged. The Lord, no, it's too good. Sorry, go. Sorry? Sorry? Responsibility, all good. Where did I write that list? Holiness. Intimacy. Intimacy. Okay. What about uh, holiness? The availability of our time. Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. Obedience. We've had boldness. Obedience is a biggie. Yeah. It's a real biggie. If we step into obedience, the Lord can use that. Yeah, come on. Consecration. Well, we skip over that scripture, and Luke sticks that awkward word daily in. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So we begin to think about what sort of things the Lord might want to deal with. What are the buckets that we're putting out? What are the vessels that we're putting out that he could put out, that he could fill with this anointing? That are ready for him to... He says, if we deal with those things, if when revival comes... That we're a people prepared and we can sustain and hold on to the blessing and multiply it and see it last and last. One of the things with revivals is that it comes for a time and then it fritters and goes. But when God moves in his power, we want to be in that state until Jesus comes again. Yeah. We want to believe for that. We want to be a New Testament church until we see him face to face. Yeah. And so he's preparing us. But I hope you get excited about that. Preparation is, is never, you know, if you're, if you're working on a car and you want to spray, I just want to spray the thing. But you've got to rub it down. The preparation is not the easy bit. It's hard work. And you've got to take your time on it. But when you do, the results are awesome. Yeah. And I believe he's calling us. He's calling us to prepare. To prepare. I just want to, you can, I want you to go away. And if you will, I want you to think about what are the vessels you're calling me to bring in. There's a bit we haven't uh, we've sort of touched. There's an interesting detail in the story. It says, I want you to... Elisha says, go out. He says, go out to the woman. She's going to get out of her home. The, for some of these things, one thing we haven't mentioned was, was healing. It's a vessel. I mean, some of us, you know, if, imagine these vessels that she brought back, and the lads in their enthusiasm, they brought back a cracked pot. <laughs> you know, they said, well, I can't really use that, okay? Some of us feel a bit like that, don't we? You're talking about revival, but you don't know this rubbish that's going on in my life. Yeah. We feel a bit like a cracked pot. And so preparation in that case is healing. Healing. What about cleansing? What about a dirty pot? You know what? It needs to get clean. It needs to be washed yeah. before it can be filled with the oil. Oh, yeah. Ask the Lord, Lord, how do you want me to prepare? I'm going to put out vessels. Yeah. I believe you're coming with your rain. Mm -hmm. I believe you're coming with your poured out presence. Lord, I want to prepare my life. I just want to just uh, focus just uh, lastly uh, just on one of those issues. And I um, had the uh, privilege of preaching in Truro Baptist just before Christmas, which was awesome. And picked up on the story of, of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awesome, awesome woman. And um, we have much reason to be thankful for, for Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, when the angel first visits her in Luke chapter 1, it says, The angel went to uh, a virgin in Nazareth, betrothed to be married. And she's getting married. You think she's excited about that? I think she is. <laughs> you know, getting married is a big thing, isn't it? And uh, the planning, and in those days you'd betrothed. The betrothal is um, as, as solid as a marriage. It's just not come together yet. It's as final as a marriage in the New Testament, but you just haven't come together yet. And it can take about a year, so she's somewhere in that year. So she's beginning to plan. For the wedding. I think she is. Sort of put it in our modern context. You know, what are the sort of things you plan for a wedding? Uh, first on the list. Pardon? What was that? Wedding cake. Wedding cake. Hey, I like cake. Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to say, 
the food that we're going to have at the reception. That would be first on my list. <laughs> and that was the only thing I had to do with the planning of my own wedding, <laughs> the food at the reception. Uh, you know? <laughs> But what else is this? Is this uh, she would have to plan on, got to get, got to get the dress, got to go for the fitting of the dress, you know, beautiful white gown, get married in, wedding robes, royal robes, to wear for the wedding, queen of the day, I've got to, I've got to book the flowers, I've got to book the chauffeur-driven camel, we've got to, you know, all these plans, you've got to get her dates ready to plan, all these plans, and then she's focused, she's getting married, and then not just then, after the wedding, these are God-fearers. Joseph and Mary love God. They're followers of God. To be a final standing family in God's own people. To be a member of the covenant people of God. Respected and loved in the community. Honoured in the community. And in one moment, God comes into Mary's life and says, I want to wreck your plans for the future. There's going to be no white wedding. Because you're going to be pregnant. No wedding dress. You're not going to be respected because people are going to say, that child was conceived out of wedlock. And not only that, it's not just for the nine months you're carrying it, all your life. Simeon said to her, a sword will pierce your own soul too. So all your life, Mary, I don't just want nine months, I want the whole of your life. You've got plans for your life, Mary. But I want to come and I want to wreck your plans. And I want to give you my plans. What would you say? What would you say? Mary said, Behold, the bond servant of the Lord, be it unto me as you have said. Be it unto me as you have said. I don't know whether he finds that response in my heart today. I'm longing to be in that place. She's an incredible woman because she just said, Yes, you can have it all. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all, Lord Jesus. And she allowed the Lord to take her calendar and rip it off. Wedding, June, plans, March, April. All he, he took the calendar and he ripped it up. And he gave Mary a new calendar. His agenda for her life. What is your calendar looking like? What does your calendar look like this week? Yeah. Are you willing to hand it over to him? And see him rip it up? in order that he can give you his agenda, give you his cap. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be good. It's not going to be easy. It was difficult for Mary. Nice story, Christmas. It's awful stuff. She had to walk 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethany. She didn't have a donkey. That was rich people transport. She walked. Pregnant woman. God, what are you doing? She walked. She suffered. It was good. When she found out she was pregnant, she went to be. I love the story. Uh, she went to be with Elizabeth because Elizabeth was going through a similar thing. She got in amongst people who wanted to go the same journey. She got in with people who were going the same journey. And when they got there, there was prophetic release. Elizabeth said, yeah, when you've hit the bay with him, I will leap for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will come to pass. Her husband, I don't believe it, and he was struck dumb. But Mary, uh, Elizabeth's husband was struck dumb, but Mary... Mary had laid hold on the word of God and believed it yeah. and went for it with all her heart. Yeah. And Elizabeth said, you believe. It was an impossible thing. Said, How will this be, Mary said? The angel said to her, no freshly spoken word of God comes without the enabling to fulfill it. No freshly spoken word of God comes without the enabling to fulfill it. That's what he said to her. Mary said, I believe it. I receive it. I'm going to give my life. And that was Mary. Was it hard? It was. But then Mary herself is released in prophetic joy. The Magnificat, they call it. One of the first lines, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he who is mighty has done great things. Hallelujah. Holy is his name. Hallelujah. Just think about those just very briefly. My soul doth magnify the Lord. She said yes to God and straight away she got a big view of God. My soul magnifies the Lord. Is your God too small? Say yes to his agenda. Yeah. You've got a too small view of God. Start saying yes to him and you'll get a bigger view of him. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices. She knew joy. Yeah. Your spirit dull. You don't have enough joy. Say yes to his plans. It's tough, but you get a release of joy. 
He who is mighty has done great things. And later on we find that she knows she's a part of Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled. She's not just a, uh, around for this generation. Her life is part of God's prophetic work throughout the whole of the generation. She said, now on all generations will call me blessed. She knew that her life wasn't just going to have impact way back then. She wasn't just the mother of Jesus. Her life was going to have impact generation after generation after generation after generation. Do you want your life to have that sort of impact? Do we believe that God wants that for us? He does. He does. And like Mary, we surrender our calendars and say, time, Father God. Time, Father God. Like me, TV. I think the Lord whispered at the end of the week. I was having a TV fast for the week. And I think the Lord said, you know this fast you've got going for the week? Yeah? I says, well, it's the normal state of affairs from now on. <laughs> not quite as strict as the fast. I'll be able to watch the occasional soccer match. I don't know. That's got to go. And in its place, it's got to come time in his word, yeah. and time in prayer, yeah. and seeking his face. I sort of drawn to a close there, but I just want to lay this before you again. Are you, do you believe that God wants to pour out his spirit? Because if you really believe that, you'll start getting the vessels there. You'll start bringing them in. You'll start looking at your life and saying, I'm doing this, Father, because I'm expectant. You won't leave your buckets on the plane. You'll get them out and you'll spread them out all over the place, ready for when the rain falls. Yeah. And it is going to fall, my brothers and sisters. I will pour water on him who is thirsty. He is faithful to his promise. And if we come to him and drink of him, his promise streams will flow. Streams will flow. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, we bless you. And we just say, Lord, you know we wrestle with all this sort of stuff. We want to be your children. We want to do church your way. And we hand that over to you, Father, as much as we're ready. And we're just saying, Lord, we know you're patient. But take us on a journey and keep on at us, Lord, until we've got it. Keep on at us, Lord, until we've got it. And until we know the pouring out of your spirit. And Jesus magnified his church as never before. Father, thank you for these, my brothers and my sisters. Father, as we do church together, may we join us on the way as we see you do greater and greater things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you, folks. We'll see you. There's a dance that's in your chair. You've given us the bed. Now we're stirring up ahead.